It's good to be in God's country. <laughs> it's funny, I, I'll go into a little bit of my story in a minute, but I just, I can't escape this California thing. Even the rental car that they got me has California plates on it. I'm like, guys, seriously, I can't drive around Texas from the place I'm trying to escape. Anyway. <laughs> um, no, it's really good to be here. I, I Just to, a little brief introduction. I don't have the uh, opportunity a whole lot to do uh, itinerant ministry and go to churches on Sunday. It's not something I normally have the ability to do in this season of life. However, there are a few places where I feel like the Lord has called me to sow back into places in regions across the world and America that have really blessed me um, as I have come up in ministry and grown in the Lord. And, and one of those places really is East Texas. This has been a very, very special place in, in my heart and my wife's heart and our family. It's been a place that's very dear to us. And I actually have my um, aunt and uncle are here. Why don't you just wave your hand right down here? So I got to behave. That means I got to behave while I preach. Um, but, uh, but not just because of family, but, you know, when me and my wife, we, we, we just got married. We were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I had just finished school. And um, I, my parents were, were full-time medical missionaries, so I didn't, I didn't really have this, you know. I grew up traveling to the nations. I had a desire to, like, move and live in a hut in China. Like, that was my goal. I didn't give a rip about America, uh, which makes it really hilarious, um, the season that we're in right now. I just cared about the gospel, going to the nations, going on an adventure with God. And so when I was in college, um, I, I, I didn't want to do college, really felt the Lord said, this is something you got to do. I did it. I went to business school, got my degree. I was tired of seeing poor missionaries. <laughs> That's what I was tired of seeing. A anybody with me? I was tired of seeing the hustle to fundraise half of the year to then do ministry half of the year. I'm like, what if they could just do ministry all the time? You know, I mean, there's, there's millions, billions of unreached around the world that need the message of Jesus. And these poor missionaries just got to hustle and fundraise. And that's like, I don't want to do that. I'm going to create a business. I'm going to crush it in the business world. I'm going to fund my own ministry. That was my plan. But, you know, the Lord was just laughing. But that was my plan. And so I graduated from business school. I was flipping homes. I was doing real estate. We were crushing it in life. Everything looked like we were on the right trajectory. You know, we were living in Oklahoma, and, and all of a sudden, the holy harasser came. And I call him the holy harasser because in America, in the West, we love the Holy Spirit because he's so comfortable, and he's just a comforter and nice and sweet, makes us feel good. But we don't understand that the majority of the Bible also knew the Holy Spirit as the harasser. The confronter. You know, so many times in our life, we actually give the enemy or we blame the enemy or we try to bind the enemy for the very thing the Holy Spirit's trying to do in us. And that's what happened in my life. The Holy Harasser came and started harassing me into this calling and this destiny. And, and I'm so thankful that he did, but at the time it was so frustrating. You know, I was having these crazy dreams. I was unfulfilled. I just was like, ah, I got to do something. And so one day in Oklahoma, and I don't get to share this story much, um, but we, we, we got rid of our house, got rid of our dogs. Well, we had two dogs. We got rid of one of them, my wife's dog. We kept my dog. Uh, we packed everything into a 1998 Toyota Camry, and we left Tulsa. And we just, we had this dream in our heart to build places of worship and prayer that would change cities and nations. This big dream from God, right? One of the first cities we ever came to was Tyler, Texas. And this place means so much to me because, uh, because it was one of the first places where there was such a spirit of hospitality. Not just for us. I mean, we felt loved on and looked after. I mean, the first ever offering in the history of our ministry was taken from Tyler, Texas. And people just, they just would give us gas money. They would give us food. They would take us out for pizza. I mean, it was just like, but it wasn't that that moved me as much as it was the hospitality to the Lord. And we began doing day and night worship services. We, 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 
gathered at a gym, like a workout gym in Tyler, and we would do 24 hours of prayer and worship in the gym. We would gather people from the business community and we would host worship. We would go into coffee shops and have meetings of worship. And it was just this community. I was like, these people are amazing. And not only was, did it bless me, and then I began to discover the roots of the heritage of revival here. No wonder Keith Green wanted to move here. No wonder, you know, that, uh, that uh, entire global ministries were moved like, to, to East Texas, I mean, you got Wyoming Mercy Ships, you have um, David Wilkerson. I mean, do you guys not think that's crazy? Like, and especially in those days, for a lot of those guys, there was nothing here. But yet they were basing global ministries that reached the world out of East Texas. Now you could look at that and think, hmm, maybe God has a calling on this region. Maybe God has a mandate. Maybe there's something about what God's doing here that's going to impact the earth. Those guys sure seem to think so. I mean, Keith Green was a legend. He was writing the songs of, 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 of the church, and he was doing it from Lindale, Texas. And so I was moved by the history. I was moved by the prayers. I was moved by the people. And so I told the Lord in this season that we're in, it's so crazy and wild. And, ah, and I said, God... That's a place I always want to sow back into because it's so blessed us and it's so ministered to us. And so I'm excited tonight that we get to show this film. It came out in theaters across America. And in fact, it's, it's hilarious. I, I, I'm not a big movie guy. I know I live in California, but I don't really care about Hollywood. I don't feel a call to Hollywood or whatever. I go to the movies once a year with my mom on Christmas. But somehow God decided to take our story and broadcast it and the, the weekend that it came out in America, it was a top five movie in America. <laughs> which would make it one of the lowest budget <laughs> top five films of all time, which is still a high budget, you know. But God has taken the story. And what's so cool about it is it's the first movie to ever come out in major theaters that talks about what happened during the COVID crisis around the earth. It's the first ever movie to come out in major theaters talking about COVID, but it shares it from God's perspective. Isn't that awesome? So anyway, I'm excited tonight. It's, it's just such a, it, my part and my heart in, in pouring back into this region. And so I hope you come and bring your friends. And I think you're going to be really, really encouraged. This is the last time that we'll show it at a church or anywhere before it hits on-demand streaming. So I'm excited about that. Why don't you turn in your Bible to Isaiah 61. I want to share a word for you that I, I just feel so called to carry. It's not just for you. It's for America. Um, how many of you guys, I don't know if you saw this, but yesterday I woke up to go on a deer stand in the howling rain in the worst weather in, like, history, which didn't end up well, but... At least I was encouraged because I was in the deer stand with my two boys and I saw this pop up on Fox News. This was on the home page of Fox News. America's only hope is God. <laughs> How crazy is this? I, for, I forgot I even did this interview. And then yesterday, while I'm sitting there, I see it populate on social media it, 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 it's the number one thing on, their, on the homepage of their website. And, then, and I know that they're cons conservative or whatever, but they don't do this stuff. I mean, no major media outlet promotes America's only hope is God. Oh, and by the way, our nation is morally bankrupt, which it is, right? So they post it on Twitter. They post it on Instagram. It has the most likes of any Fox post on Instagram this year is this story. How wild is that? You know why? Here's why I feel like that this story, and I want to talk about this for a little bit, weave it into what I'm saying. Why I feel like this story has gone viral over the last 24 hours is because America is starving for hope. America is longing for good news. All we hear all day, I mean, we just came out of the midterms. It's just bashing, bashing, bashing. It's fear-mongering on both sides of the aisle. It's just horrible. It's inflation. It's crime. It's all this kind of stuff. And then in the middle of nowhere, the good news. 
is still the good news. It's still the good news. It's still the good news. It's more relevant today than it's ever been in all of history. People are starving. I would encourage you. I mean, you may not like to go on social media, but go on there and read the comments of people that commented on this. There's like, I was looking at them this morning. There's like 3,000 comments. And people are like, well, I guess we'll try God out. He is our only hope, you know. Like, I mean, it's wild, guys. Like, America is starving for hope. And so I want to read this Isaiah 61, and this, I'm going to weave it into our story. I'm not going to tell too much of our story of the last few years because I want you to watch the film tonight. But God saves his best work for the darkest days. So you could look at the season we're in right now, and I've looked at this because I have four kids, and I'm thinking, gosh, it wasn't like this when I grew up in the 90s. The heck are people's problems, you know? Like, I mean, I just like, it, 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 you can be so reactionary. And again, I'm going to hit on that Texas thing hard because I lived in Texas for three years. That was part of my story, too, is I ended up moving here and Went to Pennsylvania, and then God called us to California, and I was like, God, you're crazy. <laughs> I grew up in Montana, born and raised in Montana, and the one thing that unites Montanans together is their hatred of California. <laughs> so it's hilarious that God would call, banish us to California, and then everything would lock down. And then the state that I live in would be the most harsh, strict, communistic regulations where they would cheer on protesters and they would let you go to marijuana dispensaries and they would let you go to strip clubs and let you go to casinos. But if you go to church, super spreaders. (laughs) It's the only place you can get the virus. (laughs) We actually had a governor, listen to this, It's just hilarious. They actually thought he could tell the church that they couldn't sing. Like he's Pharaoh. And, you know, I wasn't upset that politicians were doing what they do. I mean, I had had known the intentions of political leaders. I'd known that political spirit. I was frustrated that so many Christians were complying. Like, since when are we supposed to let the government tell us how and when to worship God? I mean, read the book of Acts for crying out loud. Paul and Peter looked at them and laughed in their face and said, we're not going to stop. Well, we're going to throw you in prison. Fine, we're not going to stop. Throw us in prison. We'll just sing until the prison doors open. But for some reason, this fear thing, this reactionary thing, this, and it happens in states like this, places like this. Well, well, we're just going to build our bunker. We're going to hide in our bunker and get our ARs and wait out the end times. Are you kidding me? That sounds horrible. What about the message of the gospel? What about the light invading the darkness? What about the people of God being the good news the world's looking for? Because part of why this story happened that you're going to see tonight is because one of the darkest seasons in modern history, when suicide and depression was skyrocketing and drug and alcohol use like you heard heard about here, and, and people were just bound in discouragement. The abused were locked in with their abusers. Kids weren't in school. All this stuff was happening. The church was closed. This is the season we're supposed to shine. And I don't say that to shame. I don't say say that. I'm in a lot of churches that shut down in the pandemic. I don't know why they invite me in, but they do. And I tell them, listen, don't carry shame. Just take inventory for how you responded in that season. And just rise up and say, we ain't never doing that again. I mean, people knock on California. Listen. Listen. We had some brawlers in our state. We sued the governor and won five times in the Supreme Court. Pastors. Well, I don't know if pastors are supposed to sue. I don't think that's very godly. Well, we did. 
And guess what? Because we sued, now in the history of the state of California, it will never be allowed for the government to ever shut the church down for any reason ever. And sometimes, and this is what we were experiencing living there, being in a difficult place of being in a place where you're pressed down causes you to have to rise up. Sometimes if you live in, you know, and, and this is the thing, and I love Texas so much. I, I, there wasn't a day I woke up in the pandemic. And I'm like, God, why, why won't you send me back to the glory land? I was telling the first service when we did our first Let Us Worship we were getting beat down by Antifa in Portland and, and Satanists were pouring blood on us in Seattle and we were getting fined in Arizona and we were getting the police sent after us in L.A. and then all of a sudden we show up to do a lettuce worship in Fort Worth. I'll never forget this. 8,000 people there. And we walk in and I'm always kind of walking in these things like thinking, what are we going to have to fight, you know? <laughs> the, the police chief met me. He goes, welcome to Fort Worth. <laughs> he, said, he said this. He said, we love God. He said, I have a whole group of guys that are assigned to just protect you. I was like, where am I? <laughs> you know? But sometimes when you're in places where, you're, where you don't find that, it can be really easy to get apathetic. And I think that COVID offered us a season where it could test how real it is what we believe. I mean, I, I'm a songwriter. I'm a musician. I'm a worship leader. We were writing songs about slaying giants in the land. We were writing songs about not being a slave to fear, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> worship leaders are afraid to go to church. It's like, what, what, about, what about those songs we wrote? This is the season we need them. Isaiah 61, it says this. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim. Someone say good news. Come on, give me a little bit more Texas there. Good news. To the poor, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the narrative. The narrative is not inflation. The narrative is not political discord. The narrative is not this per pers persistent obsession with racial division. The narrative is this is the year of the Lord's favor. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Listen, this is a church and this is a region that's called to worship. I felt that ever since I came here the first time. There is a calling on this region to worship God. And, and this is a season where we got to turn that up a little more. We can't just do the three fast and three slow to get us ready for the preaching because that's our religious routine. No, 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 no. We need worship to go up everywhere. We need praise to be the norm. We need, and this is what I loved about when we came down here, it wasn't just, it wasn't just that we were worshiping in churches. We were doing worship in parking lots. We were doing it in people's homes. We were doing it in gyms. We were doing it in businesses. Like, I tell people, you know, shutting down the churches in many ways, at least in California, was one of the best things because it allowed the church to leave the building. It showed us who the real ones were. Okay, well, you know, I'm a worship leader at a mega church. It's a great church. People love it. Our live stream sounds the bomb. We got skinny jeans. We're so cool. Everybody on Instagram thinks we're awesome. We sell records that hit the charts, blah, 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 blah. But when the government tries to shut us down, are we willing to meet in the street? Are we willing to worship on the beach? Are we willing to get a little rowdy? Are we willing to do it like probably 95% of the rest of the world does it? It gives us the opportunity to see how strong our faith is, to see how real it is. You know how many churches were birthed in tents in 2020? that are exploding today, like we got churches in S Southern California and it's like bougie down there, right? It's like bougie churches and LED walls and everything. And there, there's churches that started meeting in Orange County in tents, they don't wanna go back to anything else. 
They're like, we just love the rowdiness of the tent. It's like a revival tent. And there's something about the church rediscovering the grit of the gospel. I'm preaching about it. Man, this is the history here of it. It's time for another installment in East Texas. A garment of praise for the spirit of spare. We will be called oaks of righteousness. You know what oaks do? They don't move. Oaks are unmovable. They can weather the storms. I had oaks on my property in California, 13 acres in Northern California, and I kind of lived a little bit of a Texas lifestyle in California. It's like the only place you could do that in. And um, I had oak trees, and they, we would have 110 degrees for three months straight. No water, no nothing. Those oak trees, they don't move. They've been there for, for, for decades and decades and decades. They are unmoved. They don't give a rip about the weather. And you try to, you try to get a chainsaw to them, you're going to burn through a couple blades real quick. It is a hard, hard wood, especially in California. And oak trees are unmovable. This is what the church is called to be. In seasons where people are being too, swayed to and fro by different doctrines, different theologies, different thought processes, just whenever the church is like, no, nah, we ain't moving. That's why I told people, I said, I said, the fact, now I, I, my whole family's in the medical field besides me. I don't know what that means, but either means I'm smart because I didn't want to go through the school or I wasn't smart enough. I'm not saying that this virus wasn't real, but what I'm saying is that for 2,000 years, the church has worshiped through persecution, through pandemic, through hardship. We're not about to stop now with the virus with the 99.8% survivable rate. We are oaks of righteousness. We are unmovable. It's funny, like, we, I would always get hammered with this. Well, if you love your neighbor, you put on a mask and watch, put on three masks and watch a live stream alone in your house. I'm like, no, no, no. If you love your neighbor, you step into harm's way. If you love your neighbor, you go to broken cities and make them whole. If you love your neighbor, you walk into their place of pain and hardship. Why across America? We went to 190 cities. You're going to see it tonight. Why did every city we go to, we had thousands and thousands and thousands of people. 10,000 people in Nashville. 8,000 people in Portland. Because churches were closed. People wanted hope. They didn't give a rip about my music or that I had it look like a hippie. They just wanted Jesus. And so they showed up and ministry happened. And we baptized tens of thousands of people. People got saved. They got set free. They were throwing their drugs on the stage. They were getting delivered. We do not retreat. The church of Jesus Christ doesn't retreat. And there's a whole lot of retreatist mindsets right now. I was talking to some politi political guru guys. I get in these streams right now where I'm like, okay, walk me through your strategy here. You want everybody that's conservative and loves biblical values and whatever, you want them all to move to Texas and Florida. That's your plan. Because that sounds like the dumbest plan in the whole world. We're going to let the whole nation go to, like, it's like this, this defeatist retreat surrender mentality. I'm like, that's not the gospel. The gospel is we go and we rebuild the ancient ruins. Verse 4, it says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Verse 7, instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land. And everlasting joy will be yours. So you look at a land like here. You look at the ministries that have come out of here. The David Wilkerson's, the Keith Green's, the, all the different people. And you say, God, I want a double portion. Double it. Double it in this next generation. We got a lot more issues than the last generations. God, double the anointing. Double the revival. 
And our call as believers in this hour is not to retreat from the political arena or the business arena or whatever arena. The gospel is active. The gospel penetrates. The gospel invades. The gospel takes over. I mean, Jesus said, if you want to pray like I pray, pray that this place would look like that place. Pray this, that my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean? It means that he wants Tyler, Texas to look like heaven. That's the literal way to interpret that. He wants your home to look like heaven. He wants your business to look like heaven. He wants your family to look like heaven. This is the role of believers. We, we cannot, it's like, I feel like, I feel like we're living in this era right now in America where it's like, will the real Christians please stand up? And it's like, I don't care the mega church thing, the cool church thing, the we want to be seeker sensitive thing, the whatever thing. I'm like, no, no, we just need real Christians that are immovable in their faith, that are willing to stand for the truth of the gospel. I mean, things that they say are controversial. For me to get up here and sing a song about life that's literally directly out of the Bible should not be controversial. <laughs> it's not a political song. It's a Bible song. But people have said, well, I don't want to get political. It's a cop-out. The world's starving. I mean, I don't know if you've looked at the, 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 the results of Gen Z right now. George Barna came out with research a few months ago. 40% of Gen Z is confused about their gender. So why the heck aren't pastors preaching Genesis 1? It's pretty clear. Why are we not preaching Romans 1? That's pretty clear. Well, I don't know. It's a little too. No, it's not. <laughs> There's a generation that's suffering because we don't have leaders that are able to stand on the truth of the gospel and be unmovable like an oak tree. But you know what, meant, what the enemy meant for evil? God's turning it around. We're going to see the greatest harvest of souls in Gen Z that we've ever seen. I want you to turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to pray over you today before we leave. But I want to read this. Verse 23, 1023. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. I was in a conversation with a very, very famous, super famous Christian influencer, musician, whatever, he was like, bro, things are just so nuanced right now. I said, dude, <laughs> it's not nuanced. Pretty clear right now. <laughs> no comment on who it was. But I said, it's not nuanced. It's, 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 it's actually, it's very clear. Like, the Bible's not confused. Like, there are, there are things throughout the history of the church that are being questioned that never meant to be questioned. You know, and, and here we are in this place. And, I, you know, I was so shocked. When I came to Texas, um, I came to Dallas. I have a bunch of friends there with churches, and I helped start churches there. And I, we were out here in California fighting for our lives to stay open. And these churches in Dallas were voluntarily closing. I went up to each of my friends and I said, what on earth are you doing? Like, it's fine, maybe take a week or two, try to feel out the situation. But like, it's time to roll, baby. You were born for such a time as this. We are fighting. We're not even giving the right. Our governor isn't even protecting us the right. And your governor is. And you're deciding to voluntarily not do church when people all over the world are thrown into a hellhole? Of this COVID era, like, man, we got to preach the truth. We got to preach the hope. This is the greatest time for an altar call. <laughs> Make altar calls great again. <clears throat> That's let us worship. So it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together. People are like, I don't know if the church needs more meetings. Yes, we do. I was at a men's, <laughs> a few months ago, I was in Montana at a men's breakfast at 6 a.m. 
my generation, millennials, we, don't, we, didn't, we didn't do that. This was the OGs that were there. Boomers, man. They were meeting at 6 a.m., construction guys and landscapers and different guys. And I just, I felt the presence of God so strong at that 6 a.m. men's breakfast. These men are crying. They're repenting. They're getting freed. I said, if we ignited a movement of men's breakfasts in America, we could change the whole country. I was at a men's retreat two weeks ago on a mountain in California. We had about 300 men there. Did an altar call. Get rid of addictions. Get rid of pornography. Get rid of hopelessness. Get rid of promiscuity. Get rid of men. Just all altar call. Just pouring their hearts out to God. The church right now is in revival that we were at because of that one meeting. We don't need to do less meetings. We need to do more meetings. More prayer meetings, more men's Bible studies, more worship times. Y'all need to do worship nights here. Just do them. Why? Who cares if people come or not? Doesn't matter. Just do them. Worship, more activity, more stuff. It's like this whole, this generation, they come to church like twice a month, once a month. Forget that. We got to build a new standard. We got to connect more. It says don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another in all the more as you see the day approaching. Now I want to land the plane here in verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. Someone say persevere. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. In order to receive the promise, it requires perseverance. Now I had no idea the gauntlet of what we would have had to go through in the last two years to see what we've seen, I would have said no a thousand times had I known what it would put my family through. I mean, you'll see my wife, she breaks down crying in this film. I mean, it's just raw moments of vulnerability. I tell people, if you want to change, if, if you want everyone to like you, if that's your main goal in life, sell ice cream. But if you want to change the world, get ready for resistance. Listen, every single person in here, you are born to change the world. You are disruptors. You are disturbers of every environment that God is not welcome in. You are a walking contradiction to the ways of the world. Forget this blending in stuff. No, you're weird and you stick out. <laughs> Keith, Keith Green did this well. <laughs> you're weird and you stick out. In fact, I'm going to read this and then I'm going to read a Keith Green quote to end. But it says, in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks that's savage. I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. I don't know about you, but I do not want the Lord saying that about me. Verse 39, but we do not belong to those who shrink back. Come on, someone in Texas, say that with me. But we do not belong to those who shrink back. Come on, say it again. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Why don't you stand with me? I'm excited for tonight. I'm excited for you to guys see this. On your way out, there's books and albums and shirts and whatever, and all of that goes to support our ministry. None of it goes to me. It all goes to our ministry and what we're doing around the world. Uh, we have a big year next year, a huge year. We're actually going to um, bring Let Us Worship to 50 U.S. state capitals. <laughs> so y'all can send me some espresso. We just feel like it's significant, you know, in a post-Roe era that the fight for life and the fight for so much is now in the state level. And so guess what? We're going to be rolling into Austin Keep Austin weird, keep Austin on fire. 
And I, I, you know, all of these capital cities are so crazy. It's like, you want to go to the middle of the craziness in every state, go to the capital. And that's where we're going to be, in every state across America. And, and so you can be praying for us. And if you want to text, uh, if you text Sean to 2022-1, it'll keep you updated with what we're doing. And we'll have an opportunity tonight or, or even later today if you want to sow into this, this massive, massive undertaking really to change America, to change it for Jesus. I want to read this quote I posted today. It's from Lindale, Texas. No compromise is what the whole gospel Jesus is about. For I tell you, no man can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. In a day when believers seem to be trying to please both the world and the Lord, which is impossible, when people are far more concerned about offending their friends than offending God, there is only one answer. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Keith Green. Lord, I thank you today. I thank you today for this church. I thank you today for these believers. I thank you for what you're doing in East Texas. I thank you, God, that you're that another wave of revival, another installment of a move of your spirit is going to happen in our day. I pray that every person here would leave with courage and conviction and boldness. I thank you, Lord God, that you chose them to live here for such a time as this. Lord, I pray that as they leave, that every burden, every yoke, every amount of heaviness and depression and heartache, God, that it would come off of them. I pray that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. God, that you would give them the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I thank you, Jesus, that you're on the throne and that you're in control. And I pray over this church cross point, God, let this be a beacon of light in a dark world. Let this be a church where worship is lifted high. Let this be a place of freedom. Let this be a house of breakthrough. Let miracles happen here. Lord, we just pray, God, even as people walk in the doors of this church, God, that they would feel your presence and know your power. I pray for a season of salvations, salvations, salvations. Ignite the youth in this church. Ignite the men in this church. God, ignite the worship in this church. Let this be a place where you are welcomed. Let this be a place where you dwell. In Jesus' name.